Good evening, everyone. I'm Brian Nicely, Executive Director here at the Ellison Art Museum. And I'd like to welcome you to our inaugural um, gallery conversation night. Um, this is the first in our series we hope to go forward in the future. And tonight we're talking about the art of women's work. Um, we're talking about women's work this year because it's the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. And we've actually had a whole series of exhibitions this entire year on the topic of women's work. So I hope you have a chance for when you're here to look around the museum. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, I hope you make an appointment and come in and see the artwork that we have up. And we hope you enjoy this series as we put forward. Um, I look forward to this conversation tonight with our four distinguished women here. And um, I would like to thank Jane Yermaska for helping us arrange this panel discussion. And I will turn things over to her, and she's going to introduce our panelists. So, Jane. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, everyone. Those in the room, we're delighted you're with us. Those on Facebook, equally thrilled. And most especially, to our four inspiring women. I am so excited for this evening. It's been a little while in the making and some different changes because of the times that we're in, but it's going to be as genuine and as compassionate and, and, and inspiring as if we were all here together. So thank you for being a part of this evening. Tonight we have with us Sarah Calhoun to my left, who is the owner and founder of Red Ants Pants Company and the Red Ants Pants Festival in White Sulphur Springs. Next to her is Carmelita Dominguez, who is a mother and a community activist. And Heidi Duncan, to her left, a physician at the Billings Clinic. And Julie Seedhouse, to her left, is a realtor with Century 21, and the founder of 100 Women Strong Philanthropy. Truly, they have used vision and imagination to create their dreams, when I took a minute to stand back and think about these women, they've all created community in their own unique ways. So I'm very excited to hear what they have to share with us tonight. Shall we begin, Sarah? All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is truly an honor to be here this evening. Uh, and a big thank you to the Yellowstone Art Museum for celebrating women's work as we know, women are always working and not nearly celebrated enough, so thank you for that. And if any of you get a chance to see this exhibit, it is very much worth your time. So it also is an honor to be with my fellow panelists this evening. It's really neat to see so many strong women in different sectors across the state and really, really kicking butt, so thank you guys. So I'm just gonna tell a little bit about uh, my story and Red Ants Pants and how that came to be in uh, Little Old White Sulphur Springs. So, so my background, I grew up on a farm in Connecticut, and I went to school for environmental studies back in Pennsylvania, spent about five years working in the backcountry, instructing for Outward Bound and leading trail crews. This entire time, I could not find any work pants that fit. Um, as, as we all know, women are shaped a bit differently than men, and squeezing curvy women into square men's pants results in a number of problems, none of which are flattering or functional on the job site. So I realized that there really was truly nothing on the market. I talked to some other companies, tried to get them to start, start making women's bridges, and uh, no one really jumped at it. One guy said, if you're serious about it, maybe you should start your own company. So at the age of 25, I very naively asked myself, start a business, how hard could that be? <laughs> little, little did I know, and this is with zero, zero business schooling experience. To this day, I've never taken a business course. So first thing I needed was a name. And it turns out in an ant colony, it is the female ants that do all of the work. The male ants simply breed and die. And that is the true story. So I had my name, Red Ants Pants, it stuck. Um, so in 2004, I moved to Bozeman, Montana. I had never visited the state at this point. Uh, I didn't know what a business plan was, so I bought a copy of Small Business for Dummies. Excellent read. I was reading it the very first weekend I moved to Montana at a coffee shop in Bozeman. The guy noticed we got to talking, and it turns out for 20 years he had done production and design for a little company called Patagonia. So a very, very fateful day indeed. He brought me to his shop a week later, gave me loads of contacts and advice, and he said, Sarah, I think you're onto something. Be here. I think you need to move on this now. 
he continues to be on my board of advisors and he's one of my top members to this day. So the next two years I had a lot of work cut out for me. I had to learn everything there was about the apparel industry, designing products, manufacturing, marketing, branding, financing the company, all of it. Um, so, I, so I dug in and got to work. After about a year in Bozeman, I realized it was too big of a town for me. I wanted to be in a small ag town similar to where I grew up. And at that time, I just read Ivan Doig's book, This House of Sky, and that's his memoir of growing up in this little ranching town in central Montana called White Sulphur Springs. I went to visit one time, and the rest is history. <laughs> so I moved up there in 05, and then the fall of 06, opened Red Ants Fans, the international headquarters, workwear for women, and the women cheered across the nation. So there are three things I promised myself when I started this, this company. Number one, is if I can't run a company with integrity, then I don't deserve to be in business. Nobody does. Number two, if I can't create clothing that's all made on American soil and manufactured here, then I don't want to be in the clothing industry. And number three, if I can't make it personal and have fun connecting with my customers, then I don't want to be in business. I think, I think it's almost uh, a little too much when people say, oh, it's, it's, uh, it's business, it's not personal. I think that's, that's bullshit, honestly. I think we treat people very much, uh, with much more respect and much better when we know them personally and have personal relationships. And that is something that I find women do more often in, in the business world as well. So moving to White Sulphur Springs, my first Chamber of Commerce meeting ever. The Economist had just released a report naming Mar County the lowest income of any county in the entire nation. Great fit, Calhoun, right? It's only up from here. So I had moved into this historic old saddle shop. I have my, my store in the front, I live in the back, and then two apartments upstairs to rent. And that first winter, I had chimney fires and frozen pipes. I only had wood heat, and my toilet bowl literally froze solid. I had, there were bar fights, you know, that were happening upstairs, and one kid had his, uh, he sh shot himself in the leg with a pistol the first, the first year. It was one of those, one of those winters where you're wondering what you got yourself into, right? Um, and it's, it's lonely. I was 26 and didn't know a soul in the whole county. Um, and I, here I am trying to start a new company and get everything off the ground. So, so I did what I knew how to do, and that was pitching in. Another thing that we see with our community leadership in at least rural Montana, where I'm from, is uh, a lot of women leading this organization. So I joined the Chamber, the Arts Council, uh, volunteered on the ambulance as an EMT, coached volleyball, helped out on the local branches, and I got to know the people. And that was the foundation of really building community for myself in White Sulphur. So after about five years in business, we're recognizing that these pants are starting to mean something to our customers. It's not just a pair of pants. We had one gal write a letter to us saying that she wore her red ants pants into surgery because they made her feel stronger. <laughs> I know. Thank you. Um, pretty, pretty neat. But after five years, it was time to bring people together on a larger scale and celebrate. It was time to throw a party. So in 2011, in a cow pasture just outside of town, we threw the first annual Red Ants Pants Music Festival, where 6,000 fans attended. And this tripled the county's population. <laughs> we had no idea what we were in for. It took the whole community to pull it off, and it still does. Um, but amazingly it worked, and this was with a zero dollar budget. Um, all these people came and we had uh, some phenomenal music over the years. We've had headliners like Lyle Lovett, Merle Haggard, Winona, Dwight Yoakam, a lot of good ones. Um, but the really neat thing about the festival is that it brings people together from different backgrounds. There was one picture that first year that someone sent me, and there were two men standing there with their backs to the camera. They didn't appear to know each other well. They were both having a beer and enjoying the show. On the back of one guy's shirt, it said, Save the Planet. And the other guy, who must have worked for an asphalt company, his shirt said, Pave the Planet. <laughs> can't, can't make that up at all. Um, it's fun. We have, a, we have a demonstration area where we do all the uh, kind of traditional ag skills to, to show and teach to folks. And um, one of the favorite demos is of the meat cutting. So we have this old time butcher there with a hind quarter of a cow hanging off a tractor. He cuts off the, the meat into steaks and then grills it and like a, a top chef from Bozeman grills it and feeds it to the crowd. You can see why it's popular, right? But that first year, this old time where he cuts off a big chunk of meat, it slips and hits the ground and, and uh, so he picks it up, trims it off and carries on and 
It's overheard in the crowd, some guy saying, Man, this is awesome. The only place you can see this is Montana or Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We're doing something right. Um, and it, it very much a community-driven event. The, the ranchers uh, donate their land. All the school groups do fundraisers and pick rocks and fill gopher holes. And, um, you know, the, the local rotary sells water and ice. And everyone, everyone has learned to make a lot of money off this event, which is great to see for the community as well. Uh, our sheriff, with whom we work very closely, at the end of that first year, he texted and said, Awesome job, Sarah. I'll never arrest you for anything. <laughs> Check. Still have that saved. Yes. Um, but one of the most important parts about the festival is that it is a program of and fundraiser for our Betty and Scans Foundation. That's our 501c3 nonprofit arm. And that's in support of women's leadership, working family farms and ranches, and rural communities. So all the things we love. And we have several programs. One's a community grant program where we use proceeds from the festival to donate to uh, partners in all across the state who are doing projects that parallel our mission. We also have a timber skills workshop every year, four day chainsaw and carpentry classes for women just to get a little more skill building and self-reliance in there. Uh, and we are heading into our third cohort of our girls leadership program to really get them early. So this is designed for junior year high school girls across rural Montana. We select eight a year and they're paired up with young professional mentors and they do a community project back in their hometown. We have three retreats throughout the year and it's a really, really neat, impactful program to see that ripple effect. And that's really to build the hope for our youth, the pride in their rural living and the strength and courage in their leadership. So we're off to a great start and excited to really see this program develop and bring all the alumni together to create a good old girls club that is much needed these days, <laughs> if you ask me. So at the, uh, with the music festival, um, the governor's office uh, did an economic impact statement back in 2013. And they stated that um, they predicted up to 2.8 million change in hands in our rural community just the weekend of the festival way back then, which is a big deal for a little town like ours. Um, and that's not counting the secondary and tertiary effects we're seeing year round. Um, our last, our last uh, festival in 2018, we had, we had 18,000 people come to our little cow pasture. And again, this is a town of 900. It's pretty neat. And we invite you all. We are, uh, we had to postpone this year's event. Um, which was going to be our 10 year anniversary, but we will do this hopefully if all goes well next summer, July 22nd through 25th. You're all invited. We'd love it. And what's really neat to see is that um, we are seeing a lot of economic impact in our town, like on the ground happening. We've got lots of new businesses, fantastic brewery, and new streets and sidewalks. There's a barn quilt trail all around the county. Uh, we have new stores and restaurants, a new school, and a new library. Uh, Ivan Doig wrote me a letter actually a few years ago, right before he passed, and he had heard of his influence on my moving to his hometown. And he said, thank you for making it perk. So here's to all of our hometowns and making them perk. Um, we, I'm proud to say that Mark County is no longer listed as the county with the lowest income in the nation. So, thank you. All right, and now we have Carmelita. Thank you, that's amazing. I have been to Red Ends Pants with my family, and one of the things that I've loved so much is that you can bring your children there, and so you can start introducing new music early on. Is my mic okay? No? Okay. Um, so I want to thank the Yam for including me on this amazing panel. I am incredibly humbled and, and honored to be part of this. And I wanted to thank you all for coming and anyone who's on Facebook. Um, I appreciate it. So uh, this, is, this is quite a joy to be around people live and to be on such a beautiful uh, uh, backgrounds and what a great exhibit. So I, as I ponder over this topic of the art of motherhood and the art of community activism, I have to sigh. Um, what do I know about motherhood? What do I know about community activism? 
Am I doing it right? Uh, I don't know. But I can share my story, and I know that my story will continue to get multiple layers of experience over the years, and I do know that there will be some things that will remain the same. And number one is that I know that I must be true to myself. I know that inspiration does exist, and I do know that there is a lot of work that needs to be done. So knowing this, and trying to be as sincere as possible in my efforts, I know that my life will be a the art to me. So when we talk about motherhood and community activism, um, we often talk about our families, and we talk about our causes, and we talk about uh, the community. But today, I just I want to talk about my story and my perspective as a mother. I grew up as a Filipina daughter um, from immigrant parents, and I learned early on the importance of family, of honor, of making your family proud of your accomplishments and the choices that you made. And in, in some ways, family is just as important or even more important than individual desires. So when I went to college, my mind was just blown away about all these different individual ideas and the idea of being able to make your own decisions based on your, your own dreams. I completely embraced this idea of American individualism because I sought to find my heart's desire. And for me, that was finding um, a path of love, to find love. Um, it was about carving out a career that I enjoyed, and, and it was about trying to make a difference in this big world. And so I had, I was introduced to all these different topics and themes of social justice, and gender issues, and environmental issues, and I just got really excited because I decided that I was going to create a future that I designed, and that was really different than my experience so, fast forward 20 years, um, I got married to a wonderful man. Um, we live in Montana, and all of our family lives in the Midwest. Uh, we have two children. Um, we own a healthcare practice. Um, I run the business side of things, he runs the clinical side. And um, I find that the majority of my day is in service to someone in my family. So I wake up at four to try to work out, and that is my own time. Then I go um, bring the, make breakfast, and bring the kids to school, and I go to work, and I try to stuff a full-time job into three-quarters time, run my kids around to different activities, tag to with my husband, try to make dinner, try to help the kids with their homework, and then I fall asleep exhausted, which should also be my time, but right now that time is being taken up by a nine-week-old puppy. So <laughs> I, I wonder, this must sound familiar to so many of you. And, and this is a life um, that I have chosen. And this is a life that I love. But I wonder, am I doing right by my kids, my husband, myself? Am I showing them the very best of myself? I, I have a story. So my son comes in, into my office, and I've got, of course, all this paperwork on my desk. And he, come, he says to me, he's like, Mama, is, was this your dream? And I was so triggered at the response. I was so frustrated. That I was surprised by the, how it triggered such a response in me. I was like, no, this is not my dream, all this paperwork. I was going to run the botanical gardens, and, and I was going to do all this international travel. But you know, but things change, and I had kids. And, and I turned around, and I looked at him, and I said, no, honey, this is, this is not my dream. You are my dream come true. And I stopped and I said, no, oh my gosh. I, I, it's exactly, that's exactly it. My family has become my dream come true. And now I have a new dream. My dream is a long life with my husband, my kids, my grandkids, uh, lots of laughter and travel, opportunities and memories together with me in Montana. And somehow I have connected back to that strong sense of family that I grew up with in Indiana. But yet, with my kids, I want them to choose Montana because it's the right place for them. 
not just because their families here. I want them to incorporate this idea of family and the people that they love at the same time being able to do what it is they dreamed. They'd have their American dreams. So, excuse me. I started looking at billings and I looked at some of the problems that were facing future generations. And I said, well, if I'm going to do justice raising my children, I'm going to show them what I'm made of. And so I decided that I was going to actively shape my future by working hard now so that my kids would have a place to return to if they so wanted. So I was going to not just talk about social justice at home, but I was going to do something about it. I wanted to show my kids that their mom could make a difference. I wanted to show them that their mom could be scared and nervous and just reach outside of her comfort zone um, to work hard for something she believed in. I wanted to show them that if their mom could do it, that they too could have a role in shaping the community. And I taught them how to do it. And that was hard. And I said, get up and try again, and fail again. And somehow through this, try to be true to who you are. Because what happens if you do this and you are true to who you are and what you stand for, you do actually start to shape minds. And you start having conversations. And you can make a difference. Um, this work that I'm involved in now, it's not quick. It's full of disappointments obstacles, but I do believe that every effort that is made does contribute to overall change over time. So my message to you all about the art of motherhood and the art of community activism is, is simply this. Be true to who you are, the girl in the past, mother in the present, grandmother in the future. Share the the gift of your experiences. Um, dream again, be inspired again, and don't give up on the work because future generations depend on it. I know as a mother that we, well, we all know as mothers, we all know what it means to fail, what it means to stumble, but we also know that women are strong enough and we are tenacious enough that if it's worth it, we will work hard enough to get it done. And let me tell you, from my perspective, my family, your families, our community, it's completely worth it. So when we talk about creating a work of art, a mother's canvas is very, very complicated. It has so many different experiences. It's layered, it's weaved with all of these different things that create a fabric that can only be inspired by the love bestowed and the love given. So if you, if you women, if you mothers, can just be true to who you are in the past, present, and future, you will undoubtedly create a piece of art that will be appreciated for future generations. Colors come together, what pictures are on the wall, 
and um, are very observant in their own way. And I didn't particularly don't think of myself as being creative or artistic. But as I was thinking about this subject, I realized that perhaps I'm um, artistic in a, a different sort of way. And it, it gave me a renewed appreciation, I think, for what is the art of medicine. So I'm going to share some of those thoughts with you, and hopefully they're not too rambling and disjointed. Um, I found two quotes when I was you know, thinking about this that I really liked, that I think spoke and speak to the essence of this. One is from a woman named Harriet Hall, who's a retired family physician. And I'm a family physician who's been here, who's been here in Billings for now 26 years. Um, Dr. Hall is also a former U.S. flight surgeon. Her comment is that medicine is not an art like painting, neither it is, a, is it a science like physics, it is applied science. And then the, the father of, of medicine, William Osler, said in the early 1900s, even if it's still true today, the practice of medicine is an art, not a trade, a calling, not a business. It's a calling in which your heart will be exercised equally with your head. So thinking about those two quotes and, and my own experiences and being here, I grew up in Western Montana, um, went away to college, to medical school, to residency, and pretty quickly realized I wanted to come back to Montana. Um, I think a common theme that you'll probably hear from all of us, but I suspect Julie will say something similar, really a lot of community and relationships are, are the essence of, of a lot of who we are and what we do, even though it's all there, it's different. Um, I came back to Billings and started practicing here 26 years ago and um, have really enjoyed that, that time here, the relationships with people. I realize that medical practice you know, depends on generalizations that are backed by science. Um, and like Dr. Uh, Hall said, it's really applied science. There's a lot of pattern recognition and also the, the need to recognize when things deviate from a pattern. Um, I reflected that the human body itself is really a work of art. And there are a lot of things that we can know and study about it, but there's still so very many things that we don't know. And there's nothing like a viral pandemic to make us realize really how much we don't know of a novel virus. <laughs> um, but, you know, and it, it, I every day am amazed by what the human body can do. The um, power of healing, the, the power of, um, of just the body itself. But it really for me realize that, again, the art of medicine is in the relationships and in patient stories. And, and the privilege it is to be part of those relationships and those stories. The art of medicine is also like, partnering with people in their health journeys. It's listening, it's collaborating, it's negotiating sometimes, and it's just walking along with people in their journeys and meeting them where they are. And I think that's an especially exciting thing about being a family physician in primary care is you really get to be part of those journeys over time. Um, I mean, even something as fairly straightforward as hypertension. I mean, science says, yes, you probably should treat hypertension because uncontrolled high blood pressure damages your heart, damages your blood vessels, but it increases risk for stroke and heart disease. And yet, for um, as, as basic as that knowledge is, the negotiating that you sometimes have to do to get people to do what they need to do to take care of their blood pressure, whether it's getting out and walking a little bit more or taking a medication, um, can, can be an art form, truly, sometimes. Um, and, you know, as, as clinicians, we're trained to be objective, I, and I think for the early part of medicine, there was a, a lot of needing to be objective almost to the point of being slightly removed, but really, I think, more and more, I think medical training, we're, we're teaching students not only how to be objective, apply the science, but also how to be more empathetic, to really listen and to, um, to, to take the time to listen to what people are saying. Um, you know, certainly the ongoing challenges with exploding medical knowledge, it's, it's almost impossible to stay on top of things, but part of, part of the art also is knowing what you don't know and knowing how to find the answers and knowing who to ask. I think also in, in our current era with um, of diversity and inclusion awareness and all those conversations, um, you know, we at Billings Clinic are really undergoing a, a, a movement to really try to understand some of our own blind sides, our blind spots with diversity and inclusion, and look at ourselves. My, my current artistic endeavor is to try to understand my own um, uh, unconscious biases when I'm dealing with people. Because I think we all know they're there, and I'm really working to try to understand what those are more on a day-to-day -day basis so that that doesn't get my way coming alongside of people. 
And so just in closing, I was thinking just this week about some of the examples of those patient stories that are so powerful and, and the art um, that comes in these stories and relationships. And there were three different stories that came to mind. I um, was taking care of one of my, a uh, member of one of my four generational families that I got the privilege of taking care of. I delivered babies for 20, 20, 21 years. And so have brought some of these children into the world and um, have uh, to watch them grow with their well-child checks. I was taking care of a family member this uh, week that who's I take care of their grandmother who has diabetes. There's a member of the second generation that also is diabetic. And so having that conversation with a member of the third generation and talking about her children, about what can we do to prevent diabetes, because it's obviously what's in your family, and what is it, some of the things we can do. And just that joy of, of seeing those four generations of people. Um, I had another conversation uh, yesterday with a woman who I've taken care of for a number of years. Came in because her antidepressant medications weren't working very well anymore, and she was pretty discouraged by that. And I said to her, you know, we've been here before. Um, you know, we know that about every two or three years, your meds quit working, and we have to change them. And that's just who you are, and we'll go back to something that worked before, and it will probably work again. And, and you know, don't be discouraged. We, we've, we've done this before, we can do this again. And I, I think that was a, a, a powerful moment for her just to kind of watch her face and go, okay, we got this. Um, and one of my favorite stories is of a young woman who grew up in a community near here. I delivered her and her two younger siblings. And um, I remember her, we, we laughed about her kindergarten checkup, where she, she's a very strong-willed, stubborn young woman, and was from the very start. Um, she, for a kindergarten checkup, she crawled under the chairs in my office and would not come out for anything and glared at me for a half hour. No amount of bribing or condoling. Or, finally, I think we did get her out and get her um, shots done. But that was, and then walked with that family through the um, accidental death of their, her younger brother, their middle son. And this young woman went through a very severe depression after that and trying to help her get through that and her family figure out the right thing to or what, what to do to get her the help she needed. Um, she's now in Billings going to school, going to college, and texted me to see if I wanted to go for a walk with her on the ribs. And we did. And um, just hearing her, her world now, the joy of her classes, her, some of the new friends she was making, she talked a little bit about um, some of her experience at a camp that she had gone to to help with her depression recovery. Um, and it was, it was just a really beautiful moment to have that relationship and that she reached out to me to go for a walk with her. Um, those are the stories that uh, I hold dear, and that's part of the art of, of my world. So thank you. So I'm so um, honored and humbled to be at the table with these women, as you can see. Sarah's a legend. Carmelita is one of the most genuine and courageous women I've ever met, and Heidi saves lives for a living and brings babies into the world, and now you're going to hear from me. <laughs> so Jane asked me to speak about the art of creating a philanthropy, and I'd like to just expand that a little bit to say really the art of trying to create a culture of philanthropy. Um, but also I kind of look at it as the art of filling in the blanks, and I'll try to help you understand what I mean by that. So a tiny bit about my background. I was a high school English teacher for a lot of years. I had the opportunity to work in alumni and community and donor relations for both MSU Billings and Rocky Mountain College. And then um, I had such incredible luck to spend the last seven years working in the best real estate office in Billings and being a part of the real estate industry all of which have been incredibly challenging and rewarding and educational and have really informed everything I do to this point. So I've always approached everything I've done with the attitude of how do I fill in the blanks? So when I was teaching, they would give me a curriculum, here's your materials, here's what we want you to do with this, and then I would look at it and think, that's great, but I have a room full of ninth graders who I have to try to engage in Romeo and Juliet, and how do I even do that? So how do I fill in the blanks with what they've given me and make it better and um, 
more desirable and more entertaining. Um, when I got into alumni and donor relations and community relations, I approached things with, you know, here's how we've been doing it all along, but how do we engage them more deeply? How do we make it more fun for them? How do we make it more meaningful? And then in real estate, um, I mean, we're a dime a dozen, right? There's, there's thousands of us, it feels like. How do I set myself apart and earn people's trust in a more meaningful way? And not just with the clients that I might have, but also with my colleagues. So my goal is always, um, and my, my friends here from, from work have heard me say this ad nauseum, my goal is always when, when I call somebody and they see my name on their phone, I want their first reaction to be, I'm so glad it's Julie, I really want to work with her. I, so I've, I've really tried to fill in those blanks of how do I set myself apart. So flash forward to um, 2014, I was having lunch with a, a dear friend and because I'm a nerd like this, we were talking about philanthropy and what that means. And you know, the basic definition of philanthropy is giving money. But I really see it as something much bigger that it's about your money, but it's about your time, and it's about your talents, and your enthusiasm, and um, he and I were talking about how do you create a culture of philanthropy, especially with young people who don't have the means to really feel like maybe they can give in a meaningful way, and, and the reason I feel like I can say that, because when I was a teacher, I would occasionally find myself at a fundraiser feeling very intimidated. I can't, as a teacher, with little kids, and you know, I didn't make a lot of money. I just didn't have that that kind of cash that I would. I felt comfortable. You know, I couldn't bid at, at a at a fundraiser because there's no way I could I could pay what other people were paying. Um, so I get that. And in our conversation, we talked about how do you create something that makes young people or people without the means of any age to give a lot of money, how do you get to them to where they feel like they can make an impact? And, um, and the reason for that is what I learned through donor relations is it's good for you to be philanthropic. It's good for your soul. It's good for your health. It engages you in your community. It, it honestly, it, it, uh, it's a life-changing thing. So how do we foster that? Um, so we talked a lot about different evolutions of, of what this could look like. And what it came down to is we created a, a very basic giving circle, which is kind of a, a trend in philanthropic, philanthropic um, circles right now where you just get a group of people together and the members give money and then you turn around and give the money away. It's, it's pretty simple, but you take a, a small donation and you kind of combine it with a whole bunch of donations and you turn it into something really impactful. And I'll just tell you, in the, in the very begin, beginnings of this, I, I talked to a few of the um, nonprofits and buildings that help women and children, and that was our focus from the very beginning, and said, you know, if I gave you $100 um, dress for success, let's just say, for example, what do you do with that? And the executive director said, oh, with $100, we can buy three pairs of um, non-slip sole shoes for our, the women who many times are required to have these shoes for their jobs and it's hard for them to buy them, so they can buy three pairs. And that's impactful. And I said, okay, then let's extrapolate that. What could you do with $10,000? And she got, you know, her eyes sparkled and she said, oh my gosh, with $10,000, we could create a mobile unit for Dress for Success so we could take our services to Red Lodge or to Park City or to the reservation where they, they can't get to us, but we can take what we do to them. So that has such an effect on me in creating 100 Strong Billings that a $100 gift is impactful. There's no way, there's no way around it. But a $10,000 gift is incredibly like life-changing, impactful for a, a nonprofit. So, 100 Strong Billings was born. Um, we wanted to make it as low frills, low maintenance as possible because we wanted to engage women like these women who have so much on their plate but would love to be part of something that you can turn around and, and really make a difference with, but 
not have it take away from all the other things you're doing. So we meet quarterly. We were meeting at Craft Local because we want to make sure the girls can have a beer or a glass of wine while they're while they're being philanthropic. Um, and we'll go, we've obviously stopped doing that with COVID, but we'll, we'll be back there. So we meet quarterly. We we keep it to an hour and a half minimum. Um, we bring in three nonprofits who have capital projects. We focus on capital projects because coming from the, the donor world, I know that those are hard projects to get funds for. And the three nonprofits present to the group, everybody who's there gets to hear what their capital project is, and then we vote right there that night on our smartphones. We know that night who gets the gift, um, and we just give our money away. And we were lucky to find the Montana Community Foundation, who agreed to be the holder of our, of our funds. So everybody's $100 donation per quarter is a tax write-off. And um, we gave our first gift in January of 2018. And today, we've given a total of 13 gifts for just over $85,000 total. Honestly, it's still kind of changed my breath away to think that, that all these wonderful women you bought into this. Um, but I think we fill a blank. We, we fill one of those blanks of how do you engage a group of people who might not otherwise feel like they can make a difference. Um, some of the kind of additional benefits of creating this have been these women get super excited to see each other every quarter. And I've watched friendships develop. You know, many of them came alone to the first event, and then they've, they've formed you know, their little groups, and, and some groups stay after we're done, so when we wrap it all up after the hour and a half, they stay and have a, a, another glass of wine or a beer and hang out a little bit. You see groups going off to dinner afterwards. So that has been a really cool thing because we've kind of created this little community. Um, also, we've learned a ton about different nonprofits and buildings and the need, and I really think it has spurred some additional giving along those lines. So, uh, I guess, well, let me tell you just a couple things, a, a couple things about the gifts that we've given, just to give you an example. So, our very first gift was to the Montana Rescue Mission Women's Shelter, and it was for a commercial dishwasher, and that, that sounds like. But the, the executive director at the time, when she presented to us, talked about how the women in the shelter were having to use um, paper plates and disposable utensils for their meals because they didn't have any way to, to deal with that volume of dishes. Um, and she talked about the dignity of eating off of a real plate and using real silverware. And I had never thought of it before. But that you could feel kind of the breath come out of the room as, as people kind of uh, absorbed that, that you know, who would ever think that that's a thing, but what a great thing that we did for them. Um, we also gave another gift to the women's shelter. They had windows for their fire exits that nobody could open. And that's not a, that's not a sexy project, but holy buckets, that's pretty necessary, right? So we funded two new fire escape windows for them that, that should, heaven forbid that happen, people are going to be able to get out. Um, another one, and I love this because in my heart, from the very beginning, I was thinking, I, I picture somebody like Carmelita with her kids in the car driving by one of our projects and saying, you guys, we did that. And the Rose Park PTA uh, had a, this great little group of just the most tenacious PTA moms that decided they need they needed a, a handicap accessible playscape on their on their school playground, and they raised over a hundred thousand dollars, and we gave them ten thousand. It was kind of their initial gift that we gave them, and it's the most beautiful thing. If you haven't driven by Rose Park playground, please do because what a cool thing! And and there's our hundred strong plaque right there, so our our women can take their kids and their grandkids and and show them we did this. We were a part of something really impactful. So um, I, I just want to leave you with a, a quote from a dear friend of mine who lost her mom fairly recently, and her mom liked to tell all of her kids that what you, what you do for yourself dies with you, and 
and what you do for others lives on in eternity. And I, I really think that if you can go out and find those blanks that need to be filled, you can live that philosophy. And I know that that's what I will strive to do. It's uniquely you, however you wish to shape it, however, whatever your dream is, however big or small it might be, I hope you go after it. So this is a time now for a question and answer. Uh, please direct your question to the speaker that you would like the answer from, if you could, please. Do we have any uh, in the live audience? Please, Ralph? Yes, for uh, Sarah. Um, we live in a capitalism uh, economy, and one of the things that happens when you make a successful product like you have is that somebody wants to compete uh, and do the same thing, or somebody wants to take your product, make way more of them, and sell a lot more of them. And you know, one is scary, and the other is kind of a siren song. So, how, how have you dealt with that? Great. Great question. Thank you, Ralph. Um, it's funny, I don't even, I don't really consider myself a capitalist, but I suppose I am being in business. Um, when I was about six months into the company, I received an order from Dearborn, Michigan, and it was for each, one of each of the products we carried, and fortunately we were out of one of the t-shirts, and so I happened to call this customer, and I got her voicemail, thank goodness, because she said, hey, this is Nicole Miller with Carhartt, please leave a message. <laughs> I about fell off my chair, and I immediately called Richard Zibrell, my mentor from Patagonia, and he was like, Sarah, this is how it works in business, like they're doing their job and checking out the competition, and that was back in 06, and now there's a handful of new work for women companies that are doing great, and they all have different types of designs and styles and features and focus, and, um, and it's honestly, it's, a, it's something that has to keep, keep me on my game because you know, competition makes us better. And it's, um, it's great that it's happening because we can't supply them to all the working women around. And um, you know, what's, what's nice is to remember our cornerstone values of our mission of being made in America and um, keeping with the, the humor and heart with our brand and, and those sorts of things. But it's definitely, uh, they're nipping at my heels very quickly. So I, but we've been making masks and gowns all all summer and spring, so, um, and planning festivals and canceling festivals, so it's, it's a time capacity issue as well, but um, trying to get back after it. Thank you. Do we have any, please? This question's for Carmelita. You know, I'm a transplant here, I know you're a transplant here. Oftentimes, when people move to communities, they move for jobs that affords them the ability to get engaged in their community right away because of their work. So when families move here, what's your advice for the spouse, the partner, maybe the mother that's taking care of the kids for them to immediately feel engaged in their community? Um, I would suggest to them to get involved with whatever organization is out there. So when I first joined here, um, there was an organization called the Yellowstone Valley um, Women's Society Alliance. Um, and they asked me to join, and I thought, good God, no. I, I don't want to be part of a bunch of uh, doctor's wives. But I, I met some, I went, and I met some of my closest friends there. And it, it, to just give yourself a break, put yourself out there, and try. Because there's a lot of resources out there. A lot of, one of the best parts of Billings, I think, is an incredibly welcoming environment. So this was the easiest place for us to, to move to, because people were excited to, to, to know more about you. So that's what I would suggest. Lots of the different hospitals, lots of the different organizations make it a point to, to try to make it a good place for their families. So that's what I would suggest. Thank you. Do we have any, uh, Ryan Kramer is answering or going to give us questions from the Facebook live chat? 
we do have a couple. First, we've got a couple of shout outs from some family members, too. So, Carolyn Calvin says, Yay, sister. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Choice Smith uh, Cheddar said, Hi, <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, uh, this is actually for you, Julie. So, throughout the process of founding a nonprofit with an emphasis on improving your community, what areas of need did you determine to be the greatest of need in buildings? This is a three part question. Over the next 10 years, how can 100 Strong Buildings fulfill those needs, and how can we as a community help to ensure that those needs are met? Wow. So the greatest area of need, um, I would say it's in helping young mothers who are in a, in a difficult economic situation. Um, just for example, Family Promise was one of our gift recipients, and they needed a van so that they could deliver diapers. I guess I can take this off for a can't I? They, so they can deliver diapers to their clientele. So I had no idea this is a thing. You, you, when you take your kids to daycare, you have to have a certain number of disposable diapers for the day. If you don't have those diapers or you can't afford them, they won't let your kids come to daycare. If you don't take your kids to daycare, you then can't go to your job. So it's this vicious cycle. And the executive director told us about a mom who was drying out used disposable diapers to reuse at home so she could save her good, the good diapers to take to daycare with her. And so they, they took this van and they created a, a diaper van. So she drives all over the region and delivers literally tens of thousands of diapers. So I, I think the greatest need lies with those struggling moms who are you know, working for minimum wage, but then have to send their kids to daycare to do that and try to keep them on their feet. Um, Ryan, tell me the second part, what? Over the next five to 10 years, what can your organization do to ensure that a need like that is met? Um, and beyond, I guess, just the specific needs that you found, what needs may we have grown over five to 10 years? And then as a community, what can the community do to make sure that all those needs are met? Well, I mean, my first bit of advice would be just for everybody listening to join 100 Strong Billings <laughs> so that they can be a part of <laughs> meeting those needs because uh, um, certainly we plan to continue to do that. I just, I think it's awareness and open your eyes to what's out there and really pay attention. Um, the need, Billings is an incredibly philanthropic community. We come together and, and help our, our fellow neighbors in need in such a beautiful way, but you have to look beyond that even to, to where that deep need is. So I think it's just, you know, be open to it and be prepared to, to give what you can. Thank you. Did you say there was another question from Facebook? Uh, that's all that I have. No. Okay, anyone else in the live audience have a question? Hey, I have one for Heidi. What advice would you have for young women in looking at career choices, um, for instance, with healthcare, especially, you know, knowing what we're going through now, what would you suggest? Well, I think, I mean, really in any area of healthcare, there's need. Um, from lab technicians, you know, certainly um, nurses and uh, uh, CNAs. I mean, there's really no no area that we don't need help in now. And so I would, in, I, I like that we're starting to, as a as a community and a state, talk to middle school students and high school students about the opportunities, and not just that it doesn't have to be a four-year college degree that you get. There are so many opportunities if you want to go to um, co uh, City College and, and do a radi uh, radiology technician degree. There are just so many um, opportunities out there um, for young men and women. And I think um, we just need to, and we're starting to do this already, but as, as a community, as a healthcare community, um, find those young people, start talking to them early, start letting them know about all the different possibilities that are out there. You know, these are good jobs. And that um, there's, if, you, if you get trained, there's always going to be a need. There's always going to be a place that you can get, uh, find some work in, maybe in, in some way. And so um, 
that's, that would be my advice. Just to, and look at all everything. You don't have to be a doctor to do something really good in this. Great, thank you. And one question also, it's sort of the same one for you, Sarah, in terms of youth and um, rural areas, what your thoughts are. Yes, I think there is so much untapped potential in a small town America, in rural Montana especially, um, for folks to, who grow up there to go see the world, get, get some education, travel, do whatever you can, but to have that opportunity to encourage um, folks to come back to where they grew up, um, and to just celebrate rural and small town and looking at all the, all the possibilities. And they, um, there's a study out there that talks about how, yes, certainly industry and a good job is essential, um, and good education for their kids and families, good health care, that sort of thing. Um, but the thing, the number one thing that attracts young people back to rural towns is arts and culture, which I think is, again, tying back to the art of the work. Um, it's, it's really important to not, to not uh, discredit or overlook because it's, it's, again, what brings us together and allows us to, to work from the heart as well as from the head. Thank you. Any other questions? This is a question actually for all of the panelists. What one piece of advice would you offer your five-year-old self? <laughs> Julie? Julie, do you want to start this way? Did you say my five-year-old self? <laughs> um, to just be brave and not, not be afraid to take on something that seems Ridiculous. Great. Um, I think I would, I didn't realize it at the time, but to tell myself as a five-year-old that uh, really nothing is impossible. I, I think I, I, I realize as I'm an adult now that my parents really raised us with that kind of almost implicit understanding. And um, I've never, without them really saying anything, I've never felt there was anything that I couldn't do because I'm a girl. And I, I thank them for that, but I think I would tell my five-year-old self to leave that. Great, thank you. Carmelita? I would tell my five-year-old self um, that it's okay to make mistakes. I think it is, but it's more important to try. So just keep working, keep trying, don't give up. Thank you, yes. Yeah, typically my answer is to be true and be brave, but I will add, always listen to your mother. <laughs> always right. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Any other questions, Facebook or in the, oh, here we have one. I'd like to know what's the uh, biggest mistake you've ever made, and I'm talking about just things that happened when you were sober. <laughs>
trying to do everything and not saying no. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, any other questions here? We want to thank you. Oh, I guess I could take this off. Thank you again for being with us. Our panelists, you just truly are fabulous women, wonderful role models, terrific mentors. And if you're lucky enough to be one of their friends, you know how truly special that is as well. I think we become whole when we are engaging our heart and our soul and our minds, whether it's the scientific data side or whether it's that compassionate artistic side. And that's what makes us whole and that's what will help us make our communities whole and thrive. So I will say, come to the Art Center, uh, sorry, Art Museum. Guess where I grew up, right, in the days when it was an Art Center. But come to the Yellowstone Art Museum, enjoy the lovely art. And thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, women, for being such an inspiration to all of us. Time to go dream a dream, isn't it? Create some new visions. See some new possibilities. It's an exciting time to do it. Thank you for being with us.